I'm Virginia Holman. I'm the chapter leader for the Island Wildlife chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. We're based in Carolina Beach and currently serving the, the Lower Cape Fear region. And we're really happy to have ornithologist Lauren Farr with us today. She is an alumna of Winget University. She received her master's degree from North Carolina State University and she's now pursuing her PhD in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology as a North Carolina State University 2021 Southeast Climate Adaption Science Center Global Change Fellow. That's a mouthful. Her areas of interest include urban wildlife ecology and avian ecology and conservation. Lauren's been the recipient of many awards, including a grant from the Alongside Wildlife Foundation, a scholarship from the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, North Carolina State University's Charles B. Davey Fellowship for Excellence in Biological Sciences, and a Graduate Student Support Award from the Association of Southeastern Biologists. Lauren's also a successful science communicator. She's written and contributed to articles for BBC Wildlife, National Geographic, eBird, and the Nature Conservancy's Cool Green Science blog. She's currently an intern with North Carolina Sea Grant, where she serves as an associate editor and contributing writer for their award-winning magazine, Coastwatch. Lauren will also begin her new role as a member on the editorial advisory board for the Wildlife Society's magazine, The Wildlife Professional. So welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much, Virginia. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for being here and spending your afternoon uh, with us and thank you for having me. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, all right, wonderful. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get right into today's presentation. Let me see here. All righty. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that okay. We see it perfectly, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, so before I get into it, again, um, uh, as was stated before, just if everybody can make sure that they're muted, that would be wonderful, because I'm a petty presenter, so um, having um, no mics unmuted would be <laughs> fabulous. So today, I mean, it's gonna be a, a, a laid back environment. So today we're going to be talking about birding basics. So I have here um, birding basics, a guide for new birders. So before I get into it, I will sort of go over what I will be talking about today. So um, again, I'll sort of start off with an introduction about myself because it's, um, I've, I've noticed that it's really, you know, great and inspiring for, you know, anyone to sort of see, you know, where people, started out to, you know, where they are right now. Um, and then so afterwards, I will sort of dive into some um, birding ID basics. So again, we're going to keep it simple and basic for our, our new and beginner birders. And then next, I'll sort of go over some tools and tips to help you along the way with that bird ID. And then finally, I'll end on a positive note uh, discussing why, you know, birding is important. So with that, I will get right into it. So I will again start off with um, <laughs> where I started initially. So um, I grew up in a small town of Waxhaw, North Carolina. It's right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And I grew up, um, as so many of us are, a huge animal lover. Um, I loved all kinds of animals, big and small. So um, from the time I was young until I reached high school, I always told people that I wanted to become a veterinarian. They would always ask me, well, Lauren, what do you want to do with your life? And I'm like, I want to be a veterinarian because if you love animals, that's that's the route to go, right? So I went to um, one of my local veterinarian's offices where I worked for three years and I also completed an internship there. So I got to work again with a whole bunch of dogs and cats. So domestic animals, if you will, to keep it domestic. Um, so I worked there again for about three years and I enjoyed it. However, I, I guess it's 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 a good thing, you know, when people say, you know, get some experience in the, you know, uh, in the area that you want to work in and, you know, work in for the rest of your life, because I'm glad I did this. So um, I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed working with the veterinarians. I was, I was a veterinary uh, technician. Um, however, something just wasn't clicking. And I was like, well, 
there has to be something else, you know, that I could, um, you know, do and, and pursue, you know, in order to uh, work with animals, so to speak. So um, what I decided to do, though, was I attended Wingate University. So it's in Wingate, North Carolina. Um, it's about, you know, a few uh, a few a few hours from Charlotte. Well, not really. It's about 45 minutes <laughs> from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, but it was really, really close to my home because I am a huge, huge homebody. Um, so I decided to attend Wingate University uh, for pharmacy school, actually, surprisingly. So once I decided that I didn't want to be a veterinarian, it was at that point at the end of you know high school where everybody was going to college and deciding what they were gonna do. And again, since I didn't wanna be a veterinarian anymore, I didn't think that that was the path for me, I was sort of stuck. So I decided to pursue a path in pharmacy. Um, so I stuck with that path for about two years uh, at Wingate University. So they're well known for their pharmacy school. Um, so I stuck with that for two years, but I was miserable. Um, I was taking, you know, courses in, you know, microbiology and human biology, etc. And though these courses are important and they teach you, you know, the biology basics, if you will, I was just still not happy. Um, so what ended up happening was that I um, went to one of my biology professors and she um, is a reproductive physiologist and that's a mouthful. So basically what she does is she's a reproductive physiologist for animals, <laughs> but not humans, so for animals. And she worked with sheep. So um, when she was telling me all this, she actually told me her story, which is again why I'm telling you guys mine because I feel like it's really, really beneficial. And she told me her story about how she loved animals and she wanted to become a veterinarian herself Herself. However, she went to college and just realized that that wasn't the path for her. So she, so she switched to something totally different, which is where she found herself being a reproductive physiologist and working with sheep. So hearing this, I wanted to work with her. So I worked with her for about a year um, until I switched to birds. Um, I got to travel out to um, Idaho. So this is me and one of my um, undergraduate uh, friends here out in Du Bois, Idaho at one of the sheep stations. And we were sort of carrying out undergraduate research, if you will. So that's how I initially got interested in research per se. But what really got me interested in birds? Well, for one, I have I had an uncle who was your, you know, your average backyard birder. He loved the birds in his backyard. He loved to, you know, tell me about all the birds he was seeing. He loved to feed the birds, etc. So, you know, we would call each other every now and then and literally talk about birds. However, although I loved birds, I didn't I, I didn't really see myself, you know, doing anything with birds. So if you had told me way back when, well, Lauren, di did you know that you were, you know, going to be where you are today? The 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 straight answer is no. I I would have no idea. So um, that was an initial interest of mine, though, was you know feeding and seeing all of the different birds in my backyard. But my um, interest really hit when I um, pivoted in my research as an undergrad, and instead of working with sheep, I worked with birds. So there was another um, ornithology professor in my biology department, and he uh, specifically researched bird behavior in Chinese blue-breasted quail, which you can see right here. I'm holding in my hand a little Chinese blue-breasted quail, um, also known as king quail, and they are the world's smallest quail. So with this, he put me on the research task of researching the changes in their vocal harmonics. So, you know, basically looking at how their vocal harmonics changed when they were young to when they physically matured. So I did this research for about two years at Wingate University and I was hooked. So ultimately, this is what, you know, got me interested in birds per se. What got me interested in wildlife was when I made that switch in my degree from being a pharmacy major to a um, environmental biology major. And that's, so I started taking all of those kinds of courses in environmental biology and wildlife, et cetera. So when I took that wildlife management course, that was what really, really hooked me. So I wanted to continue my studies and learn more about wildlife and learn more about birds specifically. So I decided to attend North Carolina State University, which is in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so again, going back to me being a homebody, Raleigh's not too far from me, but you know, it's it's far enough if you get my drift. So, um, so I went to um, NC State University and I absolutely loved it. And that's when I started researching birds, um, specifically urbanization impacts on birds. So that's me at a um, banding station holding a female northern cardinal. But I'll get more into that in my research here in a bit. But again, 
um, that was just a little bit about me. Now, what is my favorite bird? This is a hard question for bird lovers to answer, but um, it's pretty straightforward for me. So my favorite bird is the Eastern Phoebe. Um, and people always ask me why. And I'm like, well, because they're cute. I mean, there's there's no other reason <laughs> for that. So these are some pictures that I took of an Eastern Phoebe um, in my backyard. And they are um, they are a species of flycatcher. So you'll see them, you know, flying around, um, catching insects, flying insects and such. Um, and you'll also, you might even hear them calling in your yard. So if you ever hear a Phoebe, they, they, they literally say their name. So they'll, they'll literally say Phoebe, Phoebe. And so when you hear that, you know that you're hearing an Eastern Phoebe. Um, so again, yeah, I would say that the Eastern Phoebe is my all time favorite bird. So enough about me, <laughs> let's get into why you all are here today. So um, some tips for basic bird ID. So again, we're gonna go into this, you know, really simple, really straightforward, but I just wanna give you all, you know, a few tips and tricks that you can um, try um, if you are a new or beginner birder. Um, and hopefully once I go over these, you know, you can use them to your advantage. And, and before I do this, please just, know that, you know, don't be intimidated by, you know, any, any of these, you know, tips and tricks, because it really does take practice. Um, so basic bird ID. So we'll start with the four keys to bird identification, um, as stated by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So if you go on the All About Birds website, this is where I pulled these tips from. They have many more tips here than what I will go over, but these are the basic ones that I feel like is extremely important to new and beginner birders. But just know if you go on All About Birds, that is a great resource to learn um, basic and new birding skills. So the four keys to bird identification here, we'll go over shape, color, behavior, and habitat. So these four things are what you can use um, to start off with in order to determine uh, the species of bird that you're seeing, especially when some species of birds look almost, you know, or completely identical. So in order to do this, I have an example here. Um, so we have two types of chickadees here, a black cap chickadee and a Carolina chickadee. And you're probably wondering, Lauren, you just took the same picture and just flipped it. I promise I didn't. <laughs> so this is basic bird ID um, in the works here. So looking at those four um, key skills here, we'll go over the black cap chickadee first. And again, I wanted to put them side by side so that you could sort of follow along and see these differences. So um, first we have our shape and size of our black cap chickadee. So we'll notice that this bird is tiny. We notice that it has a large head, a plump body, narrow tail, and a short bill. So again, noting a bird's shape and size. Next, we have color. So noting a bird's color, we see that it has a shiny black cap and a throat against white cheeks. Um, its sides are pretty buffy and its wings will be a, a back or its wings and back will be a soft gray. Another thing that you can note is the behavior of a bird. So is a bird, you know, is it busy like the black cap chickadee? Is it busy? Is it always flying around? Is it very, you know, subtle? Do, will it just sit there for, you know, a period of time, etc. So when it comes to our black cap chickadee, we see that their behavior, they're very busy and they're often feeding in flocks of several species. And this is another thing that you can look at is whether a species is, you know, feeding on the ground. Is it really you know, like a ground feeder, um, etc. Then finally, the last thing that we can look at is habitat. So where this species is found regionally and, you know, whether it's found, you know, in forests, um, backyards, etc. But a good thing to note about both of these chickadees is their, you know, regional locations. So down here where we are, we will most likely um, see um, uh, a Carolina chickadee. So if you look here at the at the habitat again, we see that the black cap chickadee is going to be found mostly in the north, whereas the Carolina chickadee is going to be found in the south. So just like those regional differences um, will be really, you know, easy to sort of tell you, well, what bird am I actually, you know, seeing? And this can, you know, be the same for, again, you know, regions, states, etc. That can be used to your advantage. So Looking at the Carolina chickadee now here on our right, again, looking at its shape and size, it looks basically the same as the black cap chickadee. <laughs> it has a short neck, it's very tiny, its head is pretty large, it has a narrow tail, and it has a very, very thick bill. Its color again is very, very similar. So it has that black cap, um, you know, white cheeks, etc. The back wings and tail are a soft, are soft gray. So, you know, again, going to that color, same color still, 
behavior, these, these species are still, you know, again, very um, acrobatic. Um, they normally space themselves fairly wide while eating. And then also where the species is found, so its habitat, they can be found in forested areas of urban or suburban yards and um, parks in, with large trees. And again, this species will most likely be found in the South. Um, as far as, just to give you a, a quick tip. So Carolina chickadees um, or chickadees in general are close cousins with the tufted um, titmouse. So if you see a tufted titmouse, um, you will most likely see a Carolina chickadee with it. So keep that in mind. So again, going over the basic bird ID of those four things, shape and size, color, behavior, and habitat, using all of these to your advantage um, will help you in order to start identifying birds wherever you are. Hey, Lauren. Now, yes, ma'am. Sorry, just real quick. Do you think you could click the hide button on the Microsoft Teams screen sharing? Oh, it's I'm sorry. There we go. Okay. That's yeah, better. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, not a problem. Gosh, I thought that was only on my end. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Thank you for pointing nope, that out. No worries. No worries at all. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So um, those again were the more, you know, basic, basic ID keys. But if you are more advanced, um, we can use these things called field marks in order to, distinct, to distinguish um, different species of birds. So when we talk about field marks, we're talking about things like stripes, spots, patterns, colors, and highlights. So um, again, this is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but we can look at field marks on the head. So to the left, we have a white-throated sparrow in that picture, and then to the right, we have a ruby-crowned kinglet. So going first over, um, going over first the white-throated sparrow. So we can look at these um, field marks in order to identify different species of sparrows because <laughs> there's there's a ton of species of sparrows, and I'll be honest, I am not I, I I am not an expert when it comes to sparrows and identifying them. I can identify few, but not a lot. But we can use these field marks, like you know, looking at their upper beak, their lower beak, throat patch their eye lines, et cetera, in order to identify what type of sparrow we are looking at. When it comes to birds who have an eye ring, such as the ruby crown kinglet here, we can also use this to our advantage. So using these identifiable you know, head markers um, and field marks per se will help us um, identify birds in a more advanced way. We can also look at things like the wing. So looking at things such as wing bars and the wing patch, can come um, you know, to a huge advantage. Um, and so to, to see these things, you know, you're, you're gonna need something like you know, a binocular or you know, some kind of spotting scope. Um, bird banders per se can use um, these things, you know, because they're they're able to have the bird in their hand and you know look at it up close. Um, so those come, you know, to to their advantage as well. But again, more advanced, but just to give you an example and some <laughs> clear pictures here. Um, so taking those two pictures again, at the top, we have the white-throated sparrow there. And again, we can see here, you know, we have their, their crown stripe here, their um, eyebrow stripe right there, looking at their beak, so their upper and lower beak there, um, and their throat patch as well can, can help us identify um, our types of sparrows as well as other birds. And then again, looking at that eye ring. So if we look here, this is a male ruby crowned kinglet. Looking at the eye ring here, you know, we see that that's very, very distinctive um, in our ruby crowned kinglet. So again, um, very, very advanced field markers, but looking at the wings too. So we're looking at these wings and these wing bars and wing patches. They're very, very distinctive. So looking at the colors on those, you know, per se can also help you in identifying what species of birds these are. But again, like I said, this is very, very advanced. Um, so don't worry, you will get there. Um, but if you start out with, you know, the, the, basic, the basic tips first and work your way up, that that will be um, wonderful. So that was just some basic bird ID. So some basic things that you can take away from, again, when trying to identify uh, various, various bird species. So, but what are some tools for um, beginner birders and new birders that can help you, um, can help you with these tasks of identifying birds? Well, we have these things called field guides. So Field guides, I love um, Sibley uh, bird field guides per se. Um, and depending on where you are, east or west, 
Um, and you can you can even get them both. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but they are very, very descriptive. They have tons and tons of pictures of birds, etc. cetera. Um, so these field guides will again, provide you with pictures of birds for their physical ID. And it will allow you to, you know, read about and note those markings, the bird size, et cetera, when trying to ID them. These field guides will also provide you with um, the bird's range and their location. So if you see, again, going back to the chickadees, think that you're looking at a black cap chickadee, but then you open the field guide and see that, oh, well, they're found in the north and I'm not really in the north. Then you'll go to your Carolina chickadee and then realize that, oh, okay, well, this chickadee is found in my area, so it must be a Carolina chickadee. And these books also um, will help. Um, they will also include like some uh, helpful ID behavior. So again, what the bird might be found doing, you know, as far as their habitats and such go. So we have our birds again, who are like ground foragers. Um, so a lot of chipping sparrows per se, they love to forage on the ground. So you will most likely see them on the ground. Um, going back to the Eastern Phoebe that I mentioned. So, a, you know, a fly catchers themselves, cause they, you know, fly in the air and catch insects. If you see a bird doing this, then it's most likely, you know, a fly catcher. So those things like that, you know, will sometimes be noted in these field guides. And that would be a great um, thing to look at when you're starting to ID birds. The next thing that we have are mobile apps. So mobile apps like um, eBird uh, by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, these apps will allow you to not only track the birds that you see, but they will also allow you to submit what we call checklists, which are used for research purposes. So you can go out, you know, in any area and, you know, put in your location and basically put in the birds, you know, that you, that you see in that area. And um, all of that data will be submitted. So your checklist can be submitted and again, can be used for research purposes about, you know, to tell scientists about the birds that you were finding in that area, etc. Next, if you're looking to get more advanced and learn, you know, about bird song per se, so that's that's really, really advanced. Again, I, I am not that advanced. I know some bird songs, but not many, <laughs> not, not, not many. But um, we can look at things like, you know, Merlin Bird ID and the Autobahn Bird Guide. These can help um, extremely, extremely with bird song. I get a ton of people who really, really want to learn bird song, and I really highly recommend um, these two apps. So again, eBird, Merlin, Audubon are really, really good apps. And I'll be sure to, um, I have these resources on an end slide, but I'll be sure to pass these along to uh, Virginia um, and everyone else in the organization. And I'm sure that they can share them with you um, if you are curious on how to find these. So the next thing that we have is equipment. So when going birding, what's the necessary equipment that you might need? Well, one, you need your binoculars. <laughs> you need a good, good set of binoculars. Um, Vortex is a really good uh, brand of, bino of binoculars to use, but I mean, honestly, you go with what you're comfortable with. Um, so again, having binoculars, um, will help you, you know, with those, um, help you build those skills in identifying birds based on, you know, field marks, et cetera, um, if you want to get that advanced. Um, more advanced birders, however, might go with a spotting scope. So spotting scopes, they can be really, really expensive, but they are very, very um, beneficial and sort of, you know, a high tech gear, if you will. Um, they can also help with, you know, with bird ID, et cetera, um, when trying to look at a bird up close. The next thing that you want again is your Sibley um, field guide or any kind of field guide per se. So when you go out birding, you know, take your field guide with you. And, you know, if you spot a bird that you and you don't know what it is, open your field guide and see if you can figure it out based on those field markers, et cetera. Um, you know, again, their behavior, uh, where where you think where, where they're found, et cetera. Um, these this can help you out with that a ton. Um, again, if you don't want to take a field guide, so there's, you know, tons of people who don't really want to lug a heavy field guide around, you can use your, your mobile apps. So your mobile apps, they'll do the same thing. Um, you can look on there to, you know, try to identify the species of bird that you see. And again, you can record it on um, eBird per se um, by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and submit that data um, for research purposes. Um, and last but not least, I just threw this in here, but um, so this is my um, gear that I usually take when I go birding. So I have a backpack and I also have a camera. So I really, really highly recommend um, if, you know, you love birds, um, I really highly recommend that if you want to document it to 
have a, a very great camera with you. Um, I am not a professional photographer to say the least, but I do love to take uh, pictures of the birds that I see. So a camera can be really, really beneficial. So just some equipment, um, that some necessary equipment that's needed um, when you go birding in order to help with those bird ID skills. So, what about um, guided bird walks and programs slash courses? So these, both of these can help, you know, to an advantage um, when trying to learn about birds, not just how to ID them, but again, like their behaviors, um, et cetera, and maybe even some cool facts. So one thing that you can do is go on bird walks. So bird walks allows, you know, beginners and new birders to experience birding while learning tips and tricks from professionals or someone who is a more experienced birder. So I know that bird walks for new birders especially can be a bit intimidating. Um, you know, there you'll sometimes have people who, you know, aren't really, uh, you know, subtle with other people when people are trying to learn about birds. And let's just say that someone identifies a bird wrong, et cetera, and someone is just so, so great to point out the fact that, you know, oh, that bird's not that, it's this. So, you know, that kind of, that kind of um, behavior, if you will, that kind of environment usually sort of, you know, deters people away, you know, once they try it and then they're like, mm, I didn't like that experience and then they just never go back. So, you know, bird walks, don't be intimidated by them. For the most part, the um, lead birder slash professional is, is wanting to make that environment comfortable. Um, and I'll get into this in my next slide, but bird walks can also allow you to form that kind of, you know, environment and meet new birders and even new birders, you know, who are trying to, you know, get out and learn um, different bird species, just like you. So in order to do this, you know, look into your local Audubon chapter or your nature center. Um, you know, there's plenty of people who, you know, are employed by nature centers um, and Audubon chapters too, to lead bird walks. So definitely look into your local one for that. If you um, want to be in the company of a more experienced birder who can also provide you with those tips and tricks when trying to identify certain species of birds. If you want to take it more advanced and a step further, you can look into programs and or courses. So in-person or online courses um, allows for individuals to gain more knowledge by learning technical terms and identification within the classroom or another educational setting. So in order to do this, you can look into the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Audubon pro programs. So Audubon um, has a ton of programs that you know you can look into um, when wanting to learn more about birds, whether it be their 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 song, um, ID, etc. They have a ton. They they even had a course um, offered about learning, you know, birds, you know, based on their colors. I mean, they, they have, they have everything. So, um, Cornell Lab and Autobahn is, um, really, really great. So again, going back to finding your community and how to meet other birders. So this is me kind of reiterating what I've already said in the last slide, but I did want to hone in on this uh, specific point. So again, joining or um, attending bird walks will allow you to find that community of birders um, and, and again, be in the company of someone who is, you know, a bit more advanced and can offer you those tips and tricks when um, learning, you know, how to ID birds. Again, you can do this by joining your local Audubon societies um, or other local clubs as well as you can also participate in citizen science projects. So again, going back to eBird. So when you submit, you know, your data, you are contributing to science. So citizen science itself, um, if, if you haven't, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically um, projects where you have like a lead researcher or a scientist um, sort of interacting or um, having the public per se uh, collect data. And with that data, that data is used, um, it's, it's being used to contribute to the, um, the research project that the, uh, that the research person is trying to answer, et cetera. So you can literally be a part of science. So again, when you're using that eBird app and you're submitting that data, you are literally being a part of science, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so again, um, eBird's Global Big Day and Project Feeder Watch are just few of the citizen science projects that you can participate in and submit data, et cetera, in order to um, help scientists. But this, you know, this, this this allows you to become more comfortable with, you know, again, birding and IDing birds, et cetera, um, while also feeling good, again, about contributing to science. So those are just some basic um, tips on 
on ways that you know that that you can be assisted with your bird ID, et cetera. But I did want to end with this segment here about why, um, essentially, why is birding important? So I mean, we we all we all can say you know that oh well I just love to bird because I love to you know see the birds in my backyard and see all the pretty birds etc. But there are more reasons um, why birding can be important. So for example, birding is important for science. So going back to citizen science here. Um, so this sort of kind of gets into my research per se. So. Um, Neighborhood Nest Watch, they are, they're based out of the Smithsonian Zoo um, in Washington, D.C., so it's run by the Migratory Bird Center um, in D.C. there, but they're sort of based, you know, all over, um, all over the world, per se, but um, Neighborhood Nest Watch, um, which is pictured here in the two pictures to the right, allows for participation from individuals to, again, assist with that data collection. So, um, Individuals per se aren't um, allowed to handle the birds because you have to be licensed to do that. However, your data again can contribute to this project. So what participants will do is they will go out and they'll participate in recitings. So with Neighborhood Nest Watch, they do bird banding in order to you know answer their scientific questions, etc. So participants, um, if they want, will go out and sort of recite these birds and you know note the birds based on the the colored bands that they're that they wear. Um, so this allows, you know, for people to become more involved and, you know, understand why this research is being done um, and also get people excited about birding. Another thing um, is that the data collected, yeah, again, helps researchers to answer questions from avian health to population success. So this is what Neighborhood Nest Watch um, is about. These are the questions that they um, that they research and that they want to get answered. So for my research for for example, here at NCSU, um, I used some of uh, Neighborhood Nest Watch um, citizen science data in order to answer, you know, um, about the effects of urban noise and light pollution. So I was um, essentially studying how urban noise and light pollution affects uh, adult avian survivorship. Um, and I had seven different focal species um, in order to do so. So if you're not familiar or not aware about urbanization, urbanization is huge. It's increasing, you know, daily with the amount of people that are that are residing in urban areas and coming into urban areas. What we don't really think about is that um, the effects of that, that the harmful effects really that we're bringing with us is impacting not only our bird species, but a ton of wildlife species. So I specifically um, look at uh, light pollution and noise pollution for that research. So again, just something to think about there. Um, I, I do tons of talks about urbanization, so but we'll we'll keep it with the the birding basics today. So um, bird banding um, is another way that birding is important for science. So you might have heard me hint to bird banding here throughout this presentation. So bird banding allows for scientists and researchers to collect high quality data. Um, that builds a strong and reliable data set in order to answer specific scientific questions. And it also contributes to conservation efforts um, and contributes to new information about the natural history of birds. So I was able to travel out to um, Powder Mill um, Avian Research Center, which is located in Rector, Pennsylvania. And I was able to go out there and practice bird banding and learn everything there was to know about bird banding. Um, if you are interested in bird banding, I would highly recommend checking out Powder Mill there. They're, they're really, really amazing. Um, with COVID and everything being online, they're actually offering a, a course, um, that, an upcoming course in order to, uh, in order to get better uh, with bird ID by, by noting things, um, you know, like, like wing size and things like that. Um, that, that would be really good to look to look into um, for sure. Um, so, but yeah, so again, bird banding again is a very, is another very important tool um, for science. Um, and um, it's another important tool for birding in general. Birding is important for your mental health. So this is really, really important. So this is me um, in one of my uh, favorite, favorite uh, nature spots here. So um, Umstead State Park, which is in Raleigh, North Carolina, it's a huge, huge park. The first time I went out there, I, I got lost. I'm not going to lie. But <laughs> ever since I've been out there, I've learned strategies in order for me to not get lost. But um, Umstead itself is a really, really beautiful park. So again, birding is important for your mental health. So there was actually a study from the University 
um, of uh, Exeter in England, which found that people living in neighborhoods with more birds and tree cover were less likely to have depression, anxiety, and stress. So just something to note there. So again, going out birding is important um, and is very uh, essential for your mental health. And very important, which is another important aspect that many people don't think about, is that birding can serve as an educational tool. So I'm not sure if you're all aware of this week called Black Birders Week, but it was a week that happened um, last year, uh, sometime in May. It was probably, I think it was the last week in May. Um, and it this week essentially was um, created by some fellow um, Black Birders. And they essentially put, put this week together in order to highlight um, minorities in the natural science field. So whether it be wildlife biology, you know, um, natural science, environmental, et cetera, um, all of this was, people were able to come together and actually see themselves being represented, you know, in these fields. And when it comes to birding, again, birding can provide um, educational and hands-on opportunities to minorities. So um, in the picture to the left here, this is me and some of my colleagues, we were able to uh, partner with the Youth Conservation Corps and Raleigh Parks in order to offer a bird banding um, demonstration. So we were able to show, um, you know, these these students, you know, why bird banding is important. We were able to mis net some birds. Um, we actually caught two house finches, which you can't clearly see, but in the picture there um, to the bottom right, uh, she's holding a house finch that we uh, released after we sort of, you know, showed it off and and showed it off to the um, students there. But just having that experience, you could see, you know, you could see their, you could see the expressions on their faces being like, wow, like this is amazing. And you could literally, you know, see everything just change right before them. They were just so amazed that, you know, this was, this was an option that they, that they could pursue. So um, again, birding can serve as a wonderful, wonderful educational tool. And bird banding is one of those ways that you can do that. Um, and this also, you know, gets more people out in nature and it raises awareness and it gets more people just like citizen science. It gets more people um, excited about the science and excited about the work that, you know, researchers and such are um, doing per se. So, I believe that, again, I have these resources here on this last slide that, again, I will pass off to um, Virginia here at the end if anyone is interested. But just having the links, again, for those field guides, um, some useful birding websites, birding apps. So, again, I highlighted eBird, Merlin, and Autobahn. Um, equipment. Uh, so the, the camera and my backpack I have in here in case you were interested in that. Bird walks, again, check with your local nature center or Audubon Society. Um, podcasts. So the American Birding Podcast, I actually just did a podcast with them. Um, this is a wonderful podcast to not only, you know, um, learn about birds, but again, also hear about what other researchers are doing and studying and, you know, how they are contributing um, to the science world there. Uh, programs and courses, again, check out Audubon Fellowships and Programs and um, Bird Academy. They offer courses um, per the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So again, they offer things from bird ID, bird song, um, learning about the color of birds, et cetera, behavior. Um, that, that, would be, that, that would be really great. And I think that would be a, a ton of interest to um, a lot of people. Um, citizen science projects. So I highlight Neighborhood Nest Watch here, but again, um, Project Feeder Watch, there's Christmas Bird Count. There's, again, submitting your checklist to eBird. Those are all citizen science projects that you can participate in um, that, again, are really, really fun. And they get people out in nature and get people really excited, not just about birds, but nature. And Last but not least, bird banding. So um, bird banding, again, I would highly recommend checking, tech, tech, checking out, blah, blah, sorry, checking out um, Powder Mill Nature Reserve. Again, they're in Rector, Pennsylvania. Um, they, per pre-COVID, you know, you could go up there and sign up for their um, bird banding class and they could teach you, you know, how to age and sex birds, et cetera. But they actually made it to where, you know, since COVID is going on and we're all remote, they actually made it to where they're able to offer this course um, online. I actually uh, attended it um, when they offered it back in February, I believe it wasn't too long ago, but and they did a really, really good job of incorporating everything that they would um, 
if we were in person. But I will say that, you know, it's it's not the same as it would be in person, <laughs> but they did their best and it was still a very, very great workshop and experience. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed this talk. I hope you got something something from it. Um, and if you would like to follow me on my social media platforms, my handle is there down at the bottom. Um, my social media is really devoted to, you know, my science communication, uh, my research, and occasionally, like I said, I'm not a professional photographer, but I will add some bird photos on there um, every now and then. And if you have any more questions, um, or if you're curious about anything that I went over today that I maybe I didn't go into much detail about it as you would have liked, you can reach me there at my email. Um, and also my website is there too. And again, I'll pass all this off to um, Virginia, and she is more than welcome to share it with um, anyone who is interested. So with that, I will go ahead and end here. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed and I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you for listening. That was great, Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, just if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or just raise your hand and we can, we can go ahead and ask them. I just have, uh, a comment, Lauren. I was one of those those birders who who started birding basically for mental health. Our yes. Son, our son <laughs> left for college, and we would go out in the field at the end of a stressful work day and look through the binoculars, and everything else just melted away. Yes. Um, yes. We didn't know much about eBird and things like that, um, but we would post on Facebook, and after about a year we began to notice, oh, I think the painted buntings are coming back because we would get the little face bird, I mean, face bird, <laughs> Facebook reminder uh, that a year, a year ago we saw yes, the birds. Yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, okay. yes, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to hear that. Yeah, birding, birding is really, really good for, you know, mental health. I always try to take um, you know, breaks between my studies. Like I'll, I'll try to venture out to like, I'll try to, I'll try to go out to different parks in Raleigh, like, you know, every weekend or every other weekend just to like see something different. But it's, it's, it's very, it's very relaxing. It really is. <laughs> so I agree with you on that one. <laughs> is there, is there an easy way uh, for people to find out about citizen science projects that might be going on in their region? Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. So the, the easiest way um, that I could tell you is to go on SciStarter.org, I believe. Um, that is, I'm, I'm trying to remember if it's .org or .com. I'm pretty sure it's .org. But if you go on that website, they have all of the citizen science projects that you could imagine um, right there on that platform. And, and I believe that there is a filter or a way that you can put in there, you know, what state you're in and what might be going on um, in your state per se. So SciStarter.org will be your best bet for that. And that's SCI? Start. Yes. So that'll be S, uh, SCI, yes, and then starter, S T A R T E R, yeah. and then dot org. Yep. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, are there a lot of opportunities to band? Band birds? Uh, so, you know, bird banding. So some of my colleagues and I are actually writing an article about this because we get a ton of questions about people wanting to, you know, get more experience. Um, and, and I will be honest, it's pretty hard because you, you, you want to first, you know, find a banding station. So not every state has a banding station, hence why I had to go to, to Rector, Pennsylvania. But, um, but it was a great trip nonetheless. But um, so that's, that's one minor like hiccup with the whole system, you know, is that not everybody has a banding station because there has to be a reason why, you know, certain people want to, you know, researchers or scientists, et cetera, want to start a banding station. And there's a whole process that you have to go through, you know, in order to do it. Um, and so just like with power mill, you know, they're a very heavy and high volume banding station. So they, they band in this net, you know, a ton of birds, you know, every, every single year. So, um, I would say that if if you could um, find out about banding stations, you know, in your area, um, if you could, if there are any, or just find wherever the nearest one is, that would be your best bet to sort of get into a class or take a course, et cetera, because you'll have to, you know, have that experience and gain that experience with someone who is licensed. So someone who is there to teach you um, in order for you to, you know, have that experience and learn how to do it before you can go out, you know, on your own. 
um, and do it per se. And there's there's a whole there's a there's a ton of steps um, that that there's a ton of steps in the whole process. Um, but it's it's really worth taking if you are interested in you know banding birds or again if you have an interest or um, um, in wanting to again open a banding station uh, if if you have a sort of you know a science project or a research led project that you're trying to get accomplished that's another way but um, definitely if you're up for it and wanting to be up close and personal with birds banding is like your your place. <laughs> It's it's very interesting, and we're we're here at the Carolina coast, and a lot of times you will come across birds that have been banded, yes. and you're able to see the letters on them, say around an oyster catcher yes. flag. Um, what yes. what do those letters mean, and is there any way that people can engage with that data online to learn more about birds? Yeah, for sure. So when we bird ban, they have have, um, so birds will have a, a steel USGS band. Um, and so on that band, there's like a set of numbers. And this is basically, this is, this is the birds, like we call it like their, their, their social security number. Like this is literally <laughs> their number there on that band. And so that number is recorded onto a banding um, data sheet there. Um, and it's very unique. So this bird will only have, you know, that, that particular number. So um, it's recorded on a sheet and it's entered into um, the bird banding lab database. And with that, and with that data, um, researchers are able to, you know, access it. The bird banding lab is able to access it and sort of see you know what's going on at different banding stations etc as far as the data being open to the public that i i am really not sure about but i, but I do know that um that you know banders they're they're trying to take a step in publishing that data so publishing the the banding data that they're collecting at their stations in order to make it you know accessible to the public and in order to communicate with the public to you know let them know that hey this is what we're finding this is right. what it means because it, it would be really interesting for you know the public to sort of see because again you get those people that are very you know, reserved about the whole, you know, situation because um, bird banding itself is a very, you know, invasive process because in order to capture the birds, we have to mist net them. And so this involves, you know, the birds flying into a mist net, getting entangled in the net, and until we extract them, you know, the bird is just there. So, you know, the birds just sitting there like, what's going on? Why am I in this thing? You know, et cetera. So there are a ton of people when it comes to bird banding. There are, you will get those people that are very, you know, kind of reserved about it. They kind of don't understand, well, why are you doing this? This is very invasive, you know, et cetera. So there are some things that, you know, especially when it comes to uh, like promoting it on social media per se, bird banders and banding stations have to be really, really careful on like how they, you know, have the bird pictured, you know, et cetera, because you will get those people that are very, very concerned. And it's, and it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's very, it's very reasonable, you know, you, you understand, but um, really I'm, I'm hoping that banders can find a way um, to effectively communicate that data that they've collected, because I feel like it would be a really great way to let the public in on what they're doing and for the public to understand, oh, okay, now I see what's going on, you know, et cetera. So, okay. which, which is again, uh, which is a good thing about citizen science per se, because people are able, volunteers are able to come in and work with the, you know, researchers and collect data. And throughout all of that, they're, they're learning about the project and why it's important. So, yeah. <laughs> And, and and things like where where the bird was banded and yes. where it wound up. But I, I I've read a couple of things recently, and and when we first started birding, maybe seven or eight years ago, mm -hmm. what was particularly interesting to me and what I I didn't know as just a lay person was the lifespan of some birds is oh, yes. significantly longer than I I realized. Uh, yes. Yes. You know, it's, the, it's, the it's amazing. 12 to 30, 35 years. It's, it is amazing. And it's really, it's really amazing when like banding stations, they like recapture birds. So that's another thing they do is, you know, they have that data there. So they're able to tell when a bird has been, you know, recaptured and whether they've seen that bird before. And when they haven't seen it for like X amount of years and then they get it back, it's like, it's, it's a big deal. <laughs> so... <laughs> for sure, for sure. So yeah, but banding themselves, yeah, with those numbers, again, that all goes into the database and that database can tell, you know, people again, you know, where the birds are migrating, um, their stopover habitat, et cetera. Um, and this can, you know, lead to researchers and help researchers and scientists ask, you know, answer a ton, a ton of questions about birds.
Now, should I've I've seen this on on some beginning bird walks where people will ask if it's okay uh, to use playback to to say hold up your cell phone and have a uh, a bird call recording in order to attract birds. What mm -hmm. what is the you know accepted protocol or um yeah for sure for sure so i know that you know a ton of a ton of researchers use playback so in neighborhood nest watch um for one they since they target specific species of birds they will use um you know playbacks in order to get those birds to come to their nets and then they do you know their they do their science um but i mean honestly i I particularly, I, I don't, my, my personal self, I don't tend to use playbacks um, on birds unless it is for scientific purposes. Um, you know, I just, I just hope that I get lucky, <laughs> lucky to see the bird that I want to see, you know, or if I don't, I'll, I'll see it sometime. But um, for science and, you know, anything like that, I, I would say, you know, when you have a strict protocol that you have to follow in a project that you're doing, um, science, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, you know, straightforward. Um, but for just, just the public, I, I would say to, I would say to probably, you to stay away from it as much as you can, um, you know, because I've 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 been, you know, but I've I've heard the same thing you have. It's it's kind of one of those conversations where you just it, you just have people where they have the pros and cons of it. <laughs> so, but you know, I've, I've heard people say that it will um, it'll sort of take the bird out of its natural yes way yes. of way of engaging and perhaps distract it from yes. feeding, expose it to predators, things yes. like that. So. Yes. Yes. Some people do tend to um, resist resist right. using that. Right. It's it's interesting. Yes, 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 for sure. I, for sure. If anyone else has any questions, I'm looking in the chat here. I'm not seeing any any additional questions in the chat or any hand raises. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Lauren? Yeah. Um, is there anything? I mean, again, I just I I appreciate everyone who came out this afternoon to spend you know your your time with us, and I just again I hope you I hope you took something away from my presentation. That's that's my goal. I just I I if it's if it, even if it was just like the minorest detail about you know like oh like she started out in pharmacy like what like cause when I when I when I tell people that their 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 faces just go wait. That's that's a total different realm. I'm like, yeah, I know <laughs> it is. But um, yeah, really, I mean, again, just when starting out learning your bird ID and stuff, just don't don't get overwhelmed. You know, don't don't feel overwhelmed. Don't if you if you are again like going to bird walks, it it is it's it's great. It's it's these bird walks aren't here and they're not offered for you to go out and then somebody's there. They're, they're not offered to be intimidating. You know, they're, they're not meant to be intimidating. They're, they're offered because, you know, we, we want you to become more involved with birds and we, we, we essentially want to teach you our ways because there's, there's, there's a ton of, you know, different ways that like, there's a ton of, you know, things that like one person might say about one bird and how to identify it. And another person might give you another tip. So it's, it's really, really beneficial. And again, it, it helps you build that community um you know of of people and allows you to meet you know new new people so that that would be my one big tip is that you know to to try to get out to a bird walk um this month if you can and okay. please do not be intimidated <laughs> well, and i'll put in a plug for island wild here in carolina beach we're having a bird walk next week and it go. will not be intimidating it's very there you go. and no. it's also free uh, i'm seeing some comments in the chat thank you very much love oh, to I'll be checking out the the camera suggestion which is a really wonderful suggestion thank you it yes. can be it can be hard in the field and it's yes. Nice to be able to go back and look at a photograph and it is it and is old guide and say oh the, I, I thought yes. I saw this, but I really saw this. So um. yes, yes, yes. I am I, I am happy to hear that. Again, I am no professional photographer, but you do not have to be a professional photographer to to learn how to use a camera. So you are fine. Yes. <laughs> so exactly. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. You are we so really welcome. appreciate it. And, um, and we'll we'll send out an email with that 
with that information and your yes. contact information as well. Yes, that's that that's that would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Again, thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me out. I appreciated it. It was a blast. <laughs> we appreciate it too. Take care. Yes. You too. Okay.